family, God bless you again. Grateful that you are spending time in God's Word uh, with Relentless Church today. Uh, it means the world to me. It means the world to my wife. It means the world to our church family. Uh, so many things have been swirling in my mind uh, just this week alone. Um, stepping into a new month, coming into uh, not only the end of summer, but the beginning of the school year. So many concerns, so many worries, so many things can plague you right now. And I am ultimately concerned about my role as a pastor and as a leader and as a voice to God's people. Um, I'm less concerned about my own personal agenda and how things turn out for me, but I am concerned about how they turn out for my kids and for their kids. And I'm now thinking much more in terms of legacy uh, as opposed to individual achievement. It's my hope that the same thing is happening for you, that you are more sober-minded and vigilant, according to 1 Peter 5. We know that we have an adversary who walks about like a roaring lion, but he can't devour you because the Bible says he's like a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion. We have a roaring lion. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. But I've been thinking about my role what it is I'm called to do. And I just wanted to take a moment before I get into the word to say thank you for allowing me to be a voice for those who call Relentless Church home and you call me your pastor. It is an honor to cover you, to, to speak the word of God, to declare the oracles of God, uh, and to lead you, I believe, uh, along the pathway of God. I want you to know that uh, I am not perfect, but I'm no slouch. I'm no punk. I'm not scared of any devils. I will go out in front of the sheep. I would lay down my life for any one of you. And my wife, my mother, and the people closest to me know this to be the case. That is the calling and the cost of being a shepherd. But the more that I come in line with who God has made me to be, the more I realize that I'm not just an evangelistic voice that travels the world. I'm not just the happy black guy that goes to the conferences and makes people smile and feel good. I'm not the guy that sings occasionally and cracks jokes. I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. My name is prophetic because my life is prophetic. And I'm saying this not because I need you to validate me or even agree with me. I'm telling you as a statement of fact because I'm coming into the understanding and into the, the, the prophetic knowledge of who I am. And today's message is designed to unlock what's in you, to ignite what's in you, and, and really to declare what's on you. Uh, you've never fit in. I'm trying to figure out like, what is Relentless Church? Like, the job of every church is to preach Jesus and to have people understand that by yourself, you and your righteousness are no good in God's eyes. You can only come into the presence of the Father through the finished work of Jesus Christ, the repentance of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Uh, cancer goes into remission. Uh, and, and, and sin goes into remission. It's a blood thing. And I need you to type that in the comment section. It's a blood thing. Uh, but, but beyond the rudimentary and the elementary foundational building blocks of salvation, which is the confession of your mouth and the belief in your heart that Jesus is Lord, the Bible says you shall be saved. Anyone who puts additional... Um, uh, constructs or additional instructions on top of what the word says is a liar. They're a false prophet. They're a manipulator. And they want you to jump through hoops to please them. And for too long, individuals have created their own economy based off of Jesus' life, his legacy, and his lordship. 
But those days are coming to an end. And what I notice and what I see in this season in the earth is that God is raising up uncompromising voices who don't care what you think about them. And the less you care about what people think, the more God can use you. I wish I had some help in this premium empty building. But I want you at home to hear what I'm saying. God has brought you here and you're not watching, you're not connecting, you're not in the comments section. Relentless is not your church by accident. Shout out to the people who moved from other cities just to be close to this Greenville location. There are people who moved from all over the country because they believe that there is a move of God. Please understand that the buildings are going to open up again sooner than you think. But when they open, the ones that come will be the remnant. Because in this season, you are either in or you're out. See, that's what people need to realize. This is the season where you're hot or cold. There is no lukewarm. There is no room temperature. There, there is no, no regular. You're, you're, either, you're either in or out. And this is the moment where God is reconciling his remnant. This is the reconciliation of the remnant. This is the congealing. This is the unification of God's remnant. This is a moment where we are stepping into the beginning of the end and we need to have voices that truly declare the word without fear without intimidation, but with absolute supernatural prophetic accuracy. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 3. The last thing we need are people who play games with the word. What we need are people who are willing to live this thing. My job and my calling is not only to preach it. My job and my calling is to equip others and unlock others. Because the truth is, when no one is looking, I'm always happy and celebratory of people who are genuinely doing the things of God. I've never taken kindly to bullies. I can always spot a manipulator. I can always spot people that aren't real. There's a difference between being human and not being real. One is a presentation to trick people into thinking you're something that you're not. And the other is the battle that happens between the flesh and the spirit. So your humanity doesn't make you fake. Your motive makes you fake. Now, I feel God right there. Now, I know it's six of y'all in here, but I need about four amens. Amen. Now, I need you to go ahead and put a, the praise hands up if I'm talking to you. But there are a number of things that I have to do in order to walk out my calling. Um, I've been getting some good comments, uh, Av. People have been saying, even some of your family were like, you know what? You look good. You look like you're doing something. And uh, I, I just want to share that uh, my wife and I are really endeavoring to, to, to be much more healthy um, we are, we are eating better. We're eating clean. We're drinking a gallon of water a day. We're doing all kinds of stuff that is, you know, good for the body, the physical body. And I have always had a struggle with, with the weight and with the discipline that comes with taking care of yourself. And I'm on that path. I don't know. I might have a bad day uh, a week from now. I might go you know, eat a sandwich or, you know, some cheese I'm not supposed to have. But the point is this, I'm doing better than I've done in the past. But there's a reason why now. I have a different motivation. I realize that my life is not my own and that I have a limited number of years in the earth. And while I'm here, I don't need to phone it in, but I need to maximize and max out my moment to make sure that I and those who are assigned to my life have done what God wanted us to do. I do not want to face God and him say, look how much you left on the table because you didn't embrace discipline, because you, you, you were content with being okay because things were just getting by, you were cool. No, I want to max out. 
And I'm praying that you want the same. I'm hoping that you're on the edge of your couch, on the edge of your chair. For some of you, I hope you're standing up. I hope you're rocking back and forth with your phone in your hand or with your, your notepad and pen in your hand because you're writing down some of the things that I'm saying. I hope that I'm speaking to you because I realize that my assignment is not to be like every other preacher in the world. I'm not to communicate like everybody else in the world. I've never fit in. So why in the world would I start trying to fit in now? I've... I'm not going to fit in because I'm not called to fit in, and neither are you. We are a nation of misfits, of, of, of spiritual, uh, intriguing individuals, what the world would call weird. The Bible calls peculiar. I'm talking to you. We think different. We talk different. We walk different. We dress different. Our swag is different. Our food is different. You are a rare generation, and I want to talk to you because of who you are, and I want to give you this scripture. Matthew chapter 3, starting at the first verse. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, for this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying, the voice in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sin. A part of this scripture to build this message around. The Bible says John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. I want to preach to a strange, beautiful, rare, necessary generation from the subject, the prophet's diet. The prophet's diet. What we need now are prophetic voices who will stand in the gap between heaven and earth and declare the oracles of God. What we need right now are voices who are so consumed with the presence of God and are committed to ring and being conduits for that they live a life of devotion, consecration, commitment, character, integrity, excellence, discipline, seeking not their own agenda, seeking not their own, seeking not their own financial remuneration, but seeking solely to lift up our Heavenly Father by prism through which the world sees Jesus in a fresh, raw, real, relevant way. We need this generation to understand that if you are living right now out of all the generations that have existed in all of time, in all of human history, here we are at the beginning of the end before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we are to follow scripture, then the Bible makes it clear that Jesus did not show up out of the blue but there was one in front of him that made it clear he was on the way. His name was John. John the Baptist. John the Baptizer. John, gift of God, beloved of God, grace of God. John, I like the name. My son's name is John. My granddaddy's name is John. Matter of fact, on my daddy's side, my great-granddaddy's name was John. My whole family, that name has mattered. What's interesting is I was almost not John Gray. When the time came for my mother to choose a name for me, 
she had decided upon the name Brian. Brian Gray. Brian Gray does not have the same ring to me as John Gray. It's a good name. Shout out to all the Bryans. Some of y'all like, I just tithe. Give me, I want my tithe back. No, uh, Brother Brian, I didn't say your name was bad. I'm talking about me and in the context of what my calling is. Real simple, John Gray. It's not a, it's not a spectacular name. It's not like Quantravius, you know. It's not one of those kinds of names. It's very simple. And if, and if there's nothing significant about me, you wouldn't remember me. But you can't get rid of me because my name may be simple, but my calling is complex. And I'm talking to people who have been overlooked based on external things, but God has given you a calling that is greater than the thing people call you. My name is simple, but my calling is not. They may think you are a school teacher, but you're actually a prophet who is an educator. You might they might think you are a banker or a financier, but actually you're anointed to be a Joseph in this generation to help accumulate wealth, to redistribute it to the people of God in times of famine. I know that some people may look at you and say, oh, you're just a masseuse or this, that, or the third. No, you have healing in your hands. And when you are doing your job, you're actually praying for your clients. And even if they're not saved, they keep coming back because they say things like, it's just something about you. I don't know what you do as a vocation, but your vocation is different from your calling. The prophet's diet. My name is John because as my mother was getting ready to name me, there was a moment when my father was not able to be in her physical presence, parenthesis, he was in jail, but he called home on the payphone. See, you can call collect from the situation from what I understand. And some of y'all have a boo that calls you collect even today. But he called and my mama with her super big afro in 1973 was talking to my father with his perm while he was incarcerated. And she says, I'm going to name our son, Brian, and he said, no, his name is John. And my mother, still married to my father, regardless of the things he had done wrong or the station he was in, honored his authority and his leadership, and she named me after my father, even though the character of my father at the time was not something she wanted repeated. I'm getting ready to go somewhere. Because what God was doing is, <laughs> if he repeats your name, he's not finished with the call. Moses, Moses, Abraham, Abraham. See, John Gray Sr., his years were cut short by cancer. My father, his years were cut short by disobedience. But God knew that there was going to need to be a continuation of the name. And so the name has a purpose attached. If you are alive, you have a purpose. Your name has a purpose attached. You can't escape it even if you want it to. Because the Bible says that there is nothing that God speaks that comes back to him void. But it shall accomplish that for which he sent it. So when God said the name John Gray, he expected for there to be some fruit connected to the name. So if the first one didn't get it done and the second one didn't get it done, then the third one needs to start moving. And what I don't get finished, John the fourth will keep going. And what he doesn't finish, his son will keep doing. There's something about your name and I need you to go ahead and sit at the table and put a napkin in your neck and I need you to put the fork and the knife in your hands because it's time for you to eat what's connected to your name. It's time for you to dine on what's connected to your calling. It's time for you to eat the prophet's diet. 10 second praise break. The Bible says that John the Baptist was sitting in the wilderness and he came preaching an unpopular gospel, Mark. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's real deep to me. 
He was in the wilderness, but when he came out of the wilderness into the city, he came preaching a gospel that was not creature comfort. It wasn't safe. It didn't feel good. It didn't, it didn't give you the warm fuzzies. It was a confrontational gospel. It was an in-your-face gospel. It was a change-your-life gospel. It was you-can't-keep-sinning gospel. It was a just-because-you're-a-Pharisee doesn't mean you're better than me gospel. I like John the Baptist because John the Baptist didn't need a whole bunch of yes-men and women around him to make him feel like he was better or that he was good. He had spent enough time in the wilderness to know that if if nobody has validated me, I am sustained in this moment by God himself, and I have been called by God. Elizabeth and Mary, maybe you know them, cousins, and they were both pregnant at the same time. Elizabeth was pregnant before Mary. Elizabeth had a husband, Zechariah, serving in the temple. An angel shows up on his watch to tell him that your barren wife's about to have a baby. He said, how is this going to be? This is impossible. I'm old and this, she's old. And the angel said, it shall happen, but because you didn't believe, you shall be mute until it happens. Why? Because some things are so delicate that you can't have a negative word spoken against it. There are some prophecies over your life that are so significant that God wouldn't even allow certain people to speak into you because they would have talked you out of your miracle. The Bible says that Zechariah's mouth stayed closed. And when it was time for the boy to be dedicated, they asked him what his name was going to be, assuming that it would be Zechariah. And he said his name is John. And the Bible says the people marveled because this was breaking tradition. I want to talk to some tradition breakers. I want to talk to some people that are watching right now that defy traditional conventions. You love God, but you don't like all of the construct of this, this regularly scheduled church life. It's not your vibe. You're not a suit and tie kind of person. You might rock, you know, you might rock some Alexander McQueen's and no socks. Hey, babe, I'm not ashy today. Are you proud of me? Put a little lotion on today. Holla at me. My ankles is right. See, here's the thing. I don't care what you wear. I don't care what you look like. I'm not the classic pastor cat. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and every time I try to fit that construct, it doesn't fit me. Stop trying to put on outfits that don't fit you. Stop trying to put on callings that don't fit you. Stop trying to put on constructs that don't fit you. Stop trying to fit in. You were never called to fit in. I wish you would go ahead and stand out. Stay swaggy. Stay crispy. Rock your braids. My wife, I, she has a drawer full of hair, wig after wig, and she will put them on and she loves them. You know what? I love them too. And I see her with her braids. You saw the braids. She got the baby hairs popping on the edges. That's who she is. She's not a classic first lady with that plastic smile. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Just I'm glad to be me, me, me. Nobody wants to hear that right now. People are dying. Give me a word from God so I can get on about my business. Tell me something that'll wake up my dream. Show me what way to go. Tell me where the devil's coming. Show me how to pray down angels. Show me how to step on devil's heads. Show me how to step into hell and snatch my family out. Give me something I can work with. I'm not a regular Joe. I'm not a Johnny by lately come lately come early church going colored individual. I'm not black. I'm not white. I'm not Hispanic. I'm human and I'm ready to do something different and I'm not regular. I'm a prophet. I'm called to do something new and if I'm talking to you, then I need you to go ahead and eat what I'm serving. This is the prophet's diet. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel like there's there's uh, some praise breaking out in houses all over the world. I think you should continue Hallelujah. The Bible says the voice of one crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. You are a generation that's called to prepare the way of the Lord. Jesus is coming back. We need a generation that says repent and turn from your wicked ways. But you can't be... Uh, 
You can't be a prophet with a price tag. <laughs> Pastor Q, it's going to be some mad people in here. Oh, Lord. You can't be a prophet with a price tag. If you're selling prophecies and selling words, and if you're selling access, then you're no better than the people that Jesus turned over in the temple, the money changers who were trying to sell access to God and trying to sell doves, symbolic of trying to purchase the Holy Ghost. You can't buy the Holy Ghost. You can't buy this anointing. You had to, you had to be born into this anointing. You had to live the life I lived to be able to preach what I preach. You can't just mimic me. There are so many people, I hear my sermons every day week and I'm blessed by it it's funny to me but the truth is if you haven't lived what I lived failed where I failed cried where I cried prayed where I prayed sowed where I sowed then you don't have the same oil as me and I'm not trying to be anybody else and you shouldn't try to be anybody else but I know this you can't manufacture what I got baby you got to serve for this you got to sow for this you got to seed for this I had to eat tears I had to eat pain I had to eat loneliness. Everybody wants the platform, but nobody wants the wilderness. Help me, Jesus. The voice of one crying in the wilderness prepares the way of the Lord, makes his path straight. But in order for his path to be straight, your back has to be broke. You got to be humbled. If you're going to walk into the prophetic anointing of this season, God's going to have to humble you. Oh, I know all about it. I know all about it. Talk to me, Moses. He was schooled and trained in all of the education of the Egyptians. The next thing you know, he's in the desert for 40 years. Angela, he's in the desert for 40 years. Anzio, he's sitting in Midian, tending his father-in-law's sheep. He went from about to be next, to, next in line for Pharaoh to a shepherd of somebody else's sheep. He didn't even have his own sheep. And the whole time, while he was in that desert for 40 years, in that wilderness, God was watching. I don't know who this is for, but I need you to know that in the wilderness you're in, God is watching. I know it looks like he's not there, but God is watching. Talk to me, Jesus. He was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. God is watching. Talk to me, children of Israel. Forty years in the wilderness, God is watching. The, the wilderness is where God watches. He watches two things. He watches the old you die and the new you emerge. And the new you is not the exciting you. It's not the television version of you. It's not the fresh beat face makeup you. It's not the one that's polished with the fresh beard cut you. You know the, the you that's emerging in the wilderness is the humble you. The whispered version of you. The hardworking, daily, monotonous, mundane task, obedient, continues to do what you need to do when no one is looking version of you. That's who God is elevating in this season. This is not the season for trash clowns who make themselves prophets. This is a season for the emergence of prophetic voices who have been serving when no one is looking. This is the prophet's diet. Help me, Jesus. The Bible says that John the Baptist ate locusts and wild honey. His food was locusts and wild honey. He wore camel's hair. This is weird. First of all, it's hot. You're in the middle of the desert. This number one is hot. You're wearing camel hair and you got a leather belt. He said, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him with the mushroom belt. You got to coordinate. Boom. You got to coordinate with the mushroom belt. You understand what I'm saying? Listen, <laughs> listen, he rocked camel hair. He are camel hair and a leather belt. That means he wanted people to know I'm not, I'm not your version of a prophet. I'm not your version of a religious uh, uh, speaker or leader. I belong to God. 
And, and so for all the quirky people that dress different, you have a different vibe, a different style, a different swag. Would you please stay true to who God made you to be? Please don't become conventional in your expression because it's, it's even your style that causes people to turn their head. And, and, and it might be an external thing that gets their attention, but it'll be the internal thing that gets their allegiance. And so... Stay swaggy, stay different, stay quirky. Rock your camel hair and your leather belt. Rock your culottes, rock your afro, you know, rock, rock whatever it is that, that gives you the freedom to feel like you are who you are called to be. But then when you get the attention of people, point them straight to Jesus. Shock them. I, I know you're into vegan and vegetarian and homeopathic remedies, and you, you are super woke. You super woke. That's great. But I need you to be woke in the spirit, and I need you to be quickened in your Holy Ghost that with all of your wokeness, there's enough anointing to bring somebody into the presence of Jesus. He ate locusts and wild honey. His name was John. He knew three things. I need you to write these down. And he was the cousin of Jesus, for those who don't know. He was Jesus' big cousin. So much so that when Mary and Elizabeth got close, John started shouting in his mama's womb, and Elizabeth got filled with the Holy Ghost just because she was near the anointing. But John the Baptist knew his calling, he knew his context, and he knew his limits. Know your calling, know your context, and know your limits. See, I know what my calling is. I, I noticed that particularly in the last six months, as I observe casually the landscape of contemporary church, Everybody's trying to create their niche to stand out. But the moment you try to create your niche instead of being your niche, you've already missed the point because whoever you are is enough for whoever's called to your life. I'm going to say this again. You don't have to become anything for the people that are assigned to your life. In fact, the more you are your authentic self, the people that are called to you will be drawn to you and the people that are not assigned to you will leave. And that's exactly what you want. Don't be upset if it doesn't work out. Don't be upset if coworkers don't vibe with you. Don't be upset because that crew doesn't mix with your crew. Be grateful that you're allowed to be authentic. Stop needing other people to validate you. Know your calling. John knew his calling, he knew his context, and he knew his limits. Know your calling. You need to know in this season, God, what are you calling me to do? Where are you calling me to do it? And, and what manner or in what way and how far do you want me to go? You need to know what it is you were created to do. If you don't know, then turn the phone off. Get off social media. Stop scrolling. Get on your face. Ask God. He will tell you if you're willing to discipline yourself enough to listen. John knew his calling. My calling is not to be the man. My calling is to set it up for the man. I'm not the star. I'm just the point guard. I just throw up the alley-oop so Jesus can dunk. I'm, I'm just a guy pointing you to God. Ha <laughs> ha, the point God, I point you to God. I'm just the guy that's doing the assist. I'm not going to score, but I'm going to get the assist. And my prayer for our generation is that we stop trying to score. Stop trying to be famous. Stop trying to be that dude or that chick. Just be who you're called to be. And let's make Jesus famous. And whatever comes with that, let us be content. Know your calling. Number two, know your context. John the Baptist understood that he was in a pseudo-religious construct where the Pharisees and Sadducees had tricked the Jews into thinking that they had power. So instead of trying to join them, he stepped away and was out in the wilderness. He dressed different. He talked different. So much so that the people 
heard him and realized this dude is saying something different and I'm getting free. And this is how he did it. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What John was saying was not popular, but it was, it was gospel. It was the truth. And what we need now are not itching ears preachers who say sweet and tender things to give you chewy, gooey things to make you feel good, but nothing is changing and you end up in hell because I wanted you to like me as opposed to telling you the truth. And the truth is sin will get you cut off from God. And if you don't repent from it, you're going to go to hell. Hell is a real place. If you don't like what I'm saying, enjoy reading what Jesus said about Sheol, Gehenna, this, this place that is real. You don't have to take my word for it. But John the Baptist understood his context. I am in a culture that needs truth and I have to be an uncompromising voice and that will make me unpopular. In fact, I'm going to preach so good that it's going to get my head handed to me. Are you willing to preach even when they cut you? Even when they talk about you? Are you willing to live it even when it's convenient? Even when you're in prison? Even when everybody leaves you alone? Even when you're no longer the flavor of the month, the flavor of the week, the flavor of the internet? Can you still serve God? The Bible says that it cost him his head, but his heart is still beating in the church today. I'm praying that there is a John the Baptist prophetic anointing that is upon us. He ate locusts and wild honey. Anybody got locusts at the house? Some of y'all like, that's nasty. You know what's funny? If you study about locusts, here's what's deep. In Leviticus chapter 11, God says this in Leviticus 11, 20 through 22, all flying insects that creep on all fours shall be an abomination to you, Israel. Yet these you may eat of every flying insect that creeps on all fours. Those which have jointed legs above their feet with which to leap on the earth. These you may eat, the locust after its kind, the destroying locust after its kind, the cricket after its kind, and the grasshopper after its kind. Freeze. The locust, the destroying locust, the cricket, and the grasshopper. Now, John the Baptist lives in the wilderness eating locusts and wild honey. Why is this significant? Because when God was freeing the nation of Israel from the bondage of the Egyptians, one of the plagues was locusts. Now, I need you to know that the thing that plagues your enemy is food for you. I'm, I'm preaching better than you shouting in your house. Did you hear what I said? It's a plague to your enemy, but it's food for you. I need you to dine on the thing that the enemy can't stand. And not only that, he ate wild honey. Now, wild honey is not honey that's prepared. It's not processed. It's not packaged. I need you to get this in your spirit. Uh, John ate locusts and wild honey. Uh, this is not a season for you to get packaged, pre-processed word, pre-processed food, pre-processed praise, pre-packaged worship. Everything is perfect and prepared, and it's two songs here, and a slow song there, and a fast song here, and a, and a prayer here, and then a 20-minute word because we want to get out in an hour. And let me tell you something, I've been in that vein, but I'm going to preach it like I feel it, and if I got to preach another 30 minutes, then we're going to be right here. And if you go, that's on you, but I'm going to preach it because the times are evil and the day is short and we need prophetic voices and we need breakthrough. We don't need just a song and a dance. I need to preach a word that breaks the back of the devil. I need to do what God has called me to do and that is the word of God and that is the call of a prophet. Yeah. The prophet's diet. The Bible says he ate locusts and wild honey. Wild honey means he wasn't a beekeeper, Aventer. That means he had to stick his hand where the bees were to get the honey. Pastor Myron, that means he could have got stung. But he understood who he was. 
And so what would sting other people, he got food from. In this season, God is drawing a distinction between the people that are afraid to go into the deep place to get the wild honey, the deep word, the fresh word, the, the revelation word versus those who don't want it because some people don't want to get stung by the truth. Some people are going to stay in the, in the shallows. They're going to stay in the, in the kiddie pool, feet where you can touch the bottom. Ah, uh, those days are over. I need some locust and wild honey saints. I need some people that will grab some locusts. You're saying locust? Ooh, I don't understand that. Here's what you don't know. Locusts are high in protein, zinc, iron, and, and here's the thing. It had everything he needed to be sustained in the wilderness. It did not look good, but it was good for him. This season, God is saying, I'm drawing a distinction between what looks good to you and what is good for you. It'll be your choice whether you eat it, but I'm going to show you the difference between them empty calorie places and the place that may not look good, but that thing will sustain you in the wilderness. Locusts and wild honey, camel hair and leather belts. Be a peculiar nation. Be a prophetic generation. Are there any John the Baptists in this place today? The prophets diet. Well, Pastor John, is there, is there somebody else you can say? I could, I could preach all day about John. The Bible makes it clear he was not to be played with. And after he died, Jesus said, of those born of women, there's not a greater than John. But the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. Help me, help me, help me, help me. Jesus said, you, you, what did y'all come to see? Just a, a reed twisted by the wind? He said, John was an uncompromising voice, willing to lay down his life. Of those born of women, there hasn't been one greater than John. Jesus said that. You don't even know how great you are sitting in there looking at me. You don't realize how amazing and anointed and gifted you are. Stop looking at me and start looking in the mirror. You need to see the greatness See what I see. See what God sees. And then you need to say what God says about you. The prophet's diet. Prophets don't eat what everybody else eats because they don't produce what everybody else produces. Whoop. First Kings 17, 1 through 6, Elijah. Come on, Elijah, go to Ahab, proclaim a drought in the land. They're going to hate you for telling the truth. But then I want you to go by the brook Cherith or Kerith, and I want you to go by the brook, and I'm going to, I want you to drink from the brook, and I'm going to have ravens bring you bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. The word Cherith or the brook Cherith, the word Cherith means cutting. The prophet's diet is always designed to cut out of you what you don't need. Woo. The Bible says Elijah sat under a broom tree and he was sustained and the ravens brought him bread and meat. I don't know what kind of meat it was. I don't know if the ravens cooked the meat before it got to him, but they, he drank from the brook. He had bread and meat and water and it was enough. I need you to stand up in your house right now. And for the six of y'all that are in here, just do me a favor for your pastor. Stand up right now. And I want you to just declare this, that what I have is enough. I need you to say it again. What I have is enough. I need you to get this in your spirit because Elijah, we're still talking about this. And watch this. The ravens fed him, uh, Brother Mark. The ravens are an adversarial bird. If you study ravens, ravens don't obey anybody. God told birds that don't do anything for anyone, go give him some food. You don't even know that God's about to bring you resource from people that don't even like you. Oh my Lord, help me Jesus. The, and then watch this. Then the brook dried up. I'm almost done. Just stay with your boy for a minute. What do you do when the brook dries up, prophet? He says, hey, this was only a season. Now I need you to go to Zarephath, which means refinery. First I needed to cut you. Now I need to refine you. 
I got a widow in there. She's going to feed you. He gets to Zarephath. Watch what he asked for. He says, could you bring me some water in a cup? Because I've been drinking from my hand. A cup is a convenience. Some of y'all needed to realize in this season, he took away all the stuff that you thought you needed. And now you realize the difference between what is necessity and what is convenience. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Cable's not a necessity. It's a convenience. Having multiple cars is not a necessity. It's a convenience for some of us. I need you to understand that now we're more thankful for what we have because we've been, we were walking around comfortable like everything we had, we deserved. But now you realize how fast it can be taken away from you, from the people you love to the things you idolize. And God says, I'm taking down every false idol and every false God, and the only thing that will remain main is the thing that you absolutely need. When he was in the wilderness, when he was by the brook, he had bread, meat, and water. But when he gets finished being cut, he gets to the widow. He says, could you bring me just a cup of water and also a morsel of bread? He never asked for meat because God cut out what he didn't need. He got down to the nitty and the gritty. Just give me some bread and something to drink. And what's deep about the bread and the something to drink is the same thing that the prophet Elijah got down to is what Jesus got down to at the Last Supper. Give me some bread and something to drink. One was water for Elijah, the other is wine for Yeshua because he was already the living water and he was the bread of life. So he was the meal and the prophet's diet needs to be the word of God. If you're not dining on Jesus, then you're eating the wrong thing. If you're dining not on Jesus, then you're eating empty calories. If you're dining on a bunch of flowery speech. It might get you fat and it might taste good, but once it gets in, it produces nothing and builds no muscle. We need some Elijahs. We need some John the Baptist that will go through the wilderness. Go ahead and get cut. Go ahead and get refined and then go ahead and like Jesus, sit at the table. Have some bread and some wine. Have a covenant meal. And Jesus said, I won't eat of the fruit of the vine until I drink it anew with you in my kingdom. The discipline and the devotion to say no to certain things because of who you are. You're a prophet. You can't date everybody. Ooh wee You're a prophet. You can't just do what you want. God is saying what you eat in this season will determine where you go in your next season. <laughs> Final point, John chapter 4. You know John chapter 4. God is spirit and those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth. And Jesus is at the well with the woman and they're talking and all of that. And, and I've preached about that and you've heard that story before. But a lot of people don't keep reading. And if you read, you'll read that in John 4, 27, the disciples came and they marveled at Jesus because he had been talking to a woman. That's not what you do when you're a rabbi on Jesus' level. Not only do you not talk to a woman, you don't talk to a Samaritan woman, but nobody questioned him. The Bible says the woman left her water pot, went into the city and said, come see a man who told me all the things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? In the meantime, his disciples urged Jesus saying, Rabbi, eat. Because if you study this, the story, Jesus was sitting by the well. There's that water again. Hallelujah. But he didn't have anything to eat. He had the water, but he didn't have anything to eat. So they're saying, eat. And this was his response. I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. The prophet's diet is to do the will of him who sent you and to finish the work. Jesus said, I am sustained by my calling. I am filled when I do what my father created for me to do. The prophetic diet of this generation is to be hungry for the deep things of God, to be hungry for the presence of God, the power of God, the purpose of God, and the prophetic plan of God. This is my mandate to you.
that you will feed on the right things so that you can produce the right things. Guard your mind, prophet. What does it say in Philippians 4, 8, and 9? Finally, brethren and sisters, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. My prayer as I close is that the God of peace will be with you and that you will dine on the prophet's diet. Learn the lessons of John the Baptist in the wilderness or Elijah by the brook where he was cut and then refined or Jesus who was by the well with a Samaritan woman who had his own stash. Jesus said, I'm good. I got food that you don't know about. And as a believer, you need to have your own stash. He said, I, I, I got strength by doing the will of my father. I got a stash. I got a, a secret stash. I got snacks. I always got a word. I always remember the prophecies. You need to start writing down the stuff that God says to you. You need to have a stash so that when the devil shows up, be like, whatever you devil, I got, I got calories right here. You can't empty me out because as soon as you come and try to attack that, I got another promise right here. For every promise of God is yes and in him, amen. I got a stash. I got a word. I keep a prayer life. I stay in God's presence. That is the prophet's diet. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, thank you for the prophetic generation that is connected to this word. And I pray by the power of your name that you would show us who we are so that we can do what you have called us to do. I love you and I give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, you need to give your life to Jesus. Let me just be real blunt. Hell is real and Jesus is coming back. There's a number on your screen. I'm getting ready to pray. And I want you to pray with me. This is not a game. This is not some play play thing. Heaven is real. It's waiting on you. As simple as a confession. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. I want you to pray this prayer. Whether you're rededicating or giving your life to Jesus for the first time, I'm telling you, you need to do it. Text this number, don't wait. This is too critical. You don't have to roll with us for the long term, but at least text the number today so I know that you have made the decision so we can follow up with you. Pray this prayer with me. Jesus, it's me. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. Thank you for the blood that has saved me. I repent. I apologize for my sins. Forgive me. I have done wrong, but the blood has made me right with you, Heavenly Father. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. And now, I walk, not in my own righteousness, but the righteousness found in the finished work of the cross. Now, Holy Spirit, come live inside. Teach me the ways of Jesus so that I look more like him each and every day. Lord, use my gifts, use my talents, use my life as a prophetic declaration, preparing the way for the second coming of Jesus Christ. You are my Savior and my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen to me. If you prayed this prayer for the first time, you are saved. If you prayed some version of this prayer before and you fell off, but then you prayed it again today, welcome back home. We've been, made, we've been waiting on you. We miss you. Now my prayer is that you will share this message with somebody. Text that number at the bottom of the screen. You want to be a member of our church? Come on, let's roll. Let's walk it out. Let's do this thing in community. 
Text member to the number on your screen. Text save to the number on your screen. For the people who have been blessed by this message and you want to sow, you want to give, then once this moment is over, there's a, a little video that'll show you how you can give if that's what you want to do. But it's no compulsion, as my wife said. You give what's in your heart. And I trust God. He keeps providing and he'll keep providing. He has to provide if it came from him. But if it didn't come from him, no man can sustain it. But if it came from him, no devil in hell can stop it. So I love you. God bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord our God be gracious to you. Show you his favor and give you his peace. I love you. Hug yourself. Make sure you eat the right things. Because you're not just a regular person. You're a prophet.